Hey guys, good morning and welcome back to another episode of I'm Just Not a Political Person. For any new listeners, here we take a look into hot political issues that should persuade people to pay more attention to politics. This week, we're going to be going international and taking a look at Hong Kong's new national security laws. Earlier this year, the Chinese government, which goes by the title of the National People's Congress, introduced new national security laws in the territory of Hong Kong. Some of us might remember Hong Kong's complicated history with communist China. Our grandparents certainly would. The people of Hong Kong, or as China calls it, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, have long sought to cut ties with China and pursue a more Western, quote, democratic lifestyle than mainland China. With the introduction of the more economically liberal Dong Xiaoping as the paramount leader of the People's Republic of China in 1978, Hong Kong appeared to reach out to American influences throughout the 1980s and 90s and continuing into the 21st century. However, recent political climates have refueled tensions between the ideological left, being communist China, and the ideological right, being the US. Even Russia became a subject of global discussion during the 2016 US presidential election, and the US-China relationship has remained rocky following events in the South China Sea. So, what does this have to do with Hong Kong's national security laws? Well, China's pretty keen to solidify and protect its physical, political and ideological borders. Hong Kong, as a territory within these borders, needs to be reined in from American influence in order for China to achieve this. Physically, Hong Kong's under no pressure, but the People's Democratic Lean poses a threat. It's a touchy subject, which makes it difficult to make any concrete statements on the matter, but a lot of people are of the opinion that these new security laws aim to criminalise any sort of dissent towards the communist rule over Hong Kong and impose harsh enough punishments that potential dissidents are warned off. The laws themselves are pretty harsh, but also pretty confusing. Preventing, suppressing and imposing punishment for the offences of secession, subversion, organisation and perpetration of terrorist activities and collusion with a foreign country or with external elements to endanger national security in relation to the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. That's from Article 1 of the laws. So the message is clear. Anyone caught doing any of the things criminalised in this act will be punished severely and labelled as an enemy of the state. In fact, the maximum penalty for breaking these laws is life imprisonment, which, considering the historical reputation of the Chinese prison systems, is not appealing. The confusing part seems to be, what's actually being criminalised? Western countries are likely to define subversion and terrorist activities differently to the Chinese government. In fact, the laws don't actually define these actions at all, leading to many people believing that as little as voicing disagreement with the government could land people in jail. This brings us to a crucial question in politics. Are these laws in violation of human rights? Political freedom and freedom of speech are both human rights, defined by the UN, and only by observing how these laws are actually enforced can we answer the question. Almost ironically, the laws actually do address this issue. Article 4 states that all rights shall be respected and protected. The rights and freedoms, including freedoms of speech, of the press, of publication, of association and of assembly, shall be protected in accordance with the law. Article 4 also mentions the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, both of which are UN documents. So why is it that a group of United Nations human rights experts wrote a direct letter to the Chinese government expressing their belief that these laws do, in fact, breach human rights laws? Quote, Specifically, we are concerned that the law lacks precision in key respects, infringes on certain fundamental rights, and may not meet the required thresholds of necessity, proportionality, and non-discrimination under international law. We recommend review and reconsideration of this legislation to ensure that the law is in compliance with China's international human rights obligations. The ensuing is a 14-page letter examining exactly why the UN felt that China needed to review Hong Kong's laws. In simple terms, it's explaining to China that they can't express the need to protect certain human rights while simultaneously breaking those exact rights and freedoms. The UN explains this in more words throughout the address. So if the United Nations is getting involved out of their own accord, then we can safely assume that yes, the Chinese government is violating human rights by enacting and enforcing the Hong Kong national security laws. In their article concerning these, the letter, news site The Guardian states that the widely condemned law has had a chilling effect on the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, as well as educators, media, academics and politicians, and reports that of September 1st, 25 people have been arrested under the laws. 
This sequence of policy acts highlights a few important concepts when it comes to media governance. We've already seen how international regulation comes into play with the actions of the UN. This also raises questions about how inf an enforcing body would be observing these criminalised acts. Now, during modern times, it's easier than ever to survey societies through technology such as data tracking and facial rec recognition. It's a pretty hot topic right now. China already uses facial recognition in everyday surveillance. A data leak last year revealed that over 6.8 million records were logged from cameras all over the country in a single day. Social surveillance is something that French philosopher Michel Foucault studied extensively, which he visualised in the feature of the Panopticon. Uh, this is pretty common in, West in all societies to use some form of the Panopticon to survey society. In this conceptualization, a central eyes and ears could potentially be observing every single citizen at all times. In a kind of Schrodinger-esque paradox, the surveyed cannot know whether they're the focus of the government's gaze at any specific moment because they can't see inside the observing body, but the possibility of it will keep them in check. Therefore, the looming threat of observation and punishment would explain the fact that out of the 25 Hong Kong citizens arrested, only one of them was actually charged. So how many people are going to break these laws? So we've talked about technology in relation to surveillance, which is a pretty hot policy topic at the moment, but we also have to talk about technology as part of the very acts of dissidence which it seeks to control. The new world of social media is hard for policymakers to keep track of. In early July, soon after the laws were passed, China announced its decision to ban popular social media act TikTok in Hong Kong, as it was already banned on mainland China which then led to other social media platforms such as Facebook reviewing their actions in the territory. Not only does this play into the UN's concerns that the laws are imposing upon free media rights, but it displays China's increasing efforts towards cyber sovereignty, in which it seeks to control internet systems within its jurisdiction. As our senior 2012 explains, the control of the internet lies increasingly in the hands of private actors and corporations, but it's very clear that in the official discourse of the Chinese government, the Communist Party will maintain a certain level of control and censorship over online activities. Internet media governments and cyber sovereignty are huge issues for politics at the moment. The digital world is developing at a rate that policymakers simply can't keep up with, which makes the future of cyber politics both incredibly important and incredibly unstable. So, to wrap things up, a lot of us might be wondering how an issue in Asia can have anything to do with how we view politics back home. For starters, China has a huge economic relationship with most Western countries, with imports and exports, so it's crucial to most governments' economic plans to keep them in the good books. Secondly, despite being labelled as the opposite end to the ideological spectrum, we can actually see similar occurrences happening in democratic Western countries as communist China. The US, for example, is currently threatening to ban TikTok, though for different reasons, but if we allow Trump to do something, how can we critique China for doing the same thing? Politics on the other side of the world has had a huge influence on domestic policies, and the more we understand about other countries, the more inf informed we are about what's best for our own.